4th of June, we arrived at Constantinople, and after a miserable reception meant as an insult to yourselves, we were given the most miserable and disgusting quarters. The palace where we were confined was certainly large and open, but it neither kept out the cold nor afforded shelter from the heat. Armed soldiers were set to guard us and prevent my people from going out, and any others from coming in. This dwelling, only accessible to us who were shut inside it, was so far distant from the Emperor's residence that we were quite out of breath when we walked there. We did not ride. To add to our troubles, the Greek wine we found undrinkable because of the mixture in it of pitch, resin, and plaster. The house itself had no water, and we could not even buy any to quench our thirst. Well, all this was a, was a serious, oh dear me. But there was another, oh dear me, even worse. And that was our warden, the man who provided us with our daily wants. If you were to seek another like him, you certainly would not find him on earth. You might perhaps in hell. On the 6th of June, which was the Saturday before Pentecost, I was brought before the Emperor's brother Leo, Marshal of the Court and Chancellor, and there we tired ourselves with a fierce argument over your imperial title. He called you not Emperor, which is Basilius in his tongue, but insultingly Rex, which is king in ours. I told him the thing meant was the same, though the word was different, and he then said that I had come not to make peace, but to stir up strife. Finally, he got up in a rage, and really wishing to insult us, received your letter, not in his own hand, but through an interpreter. He's a man commanding enough in person, but feigning humility, whereon if a man lean, it will pierce his hand. On the 7th of June, the sacred day of Pentecost, I was brought before Nicephorus himself, in the palace called Stefana, that is, the Crown Palace. He is a monstrosity of a man, a dwarf, fat-headed and with tiny mole's eyes, disfigured by a short, broad, thick beard, half going grey, disgraced by a neck scarcely an inch long, pig-like by reason of the big, close bristles on his head, in colour an Ethiopian, and, as the poet says, you would not like to meet him in the dark. A big belly, lean posterior, very long in the hip, considering his short stature, small legs, uh, fair-sized heels and feet, dressed in a robe made of fine linen, but old, foul-smelling and discoloured by age, shod with Sicyonan slippers, bold of tongue, a fox by nature, in perjury and falsehood a Ulysses. My lords and... August emperors, you always seemed comely to me, but oh, how much more comely now, always magnificent, how much more magnificent now, always mighty, how much more mighty now, always clement, how much more clement now, always full of virtues, how much fuller now. At his left, not on the line with him, but much lower down, sat the two child emperors, once his masters, now his subjects. He began his speech as follows. It was our duty and desire to give you a courteous and magnificent reception. That, however, has been rendered impossible by the impiety of your master, who, in the guise of a hostile invader, has laid claim to Rome has robbed Berengar and Adalbart of their kingdom contrary to law and right, has slain some of the Romans by the sword, some by hanging, while others he has either blinded or sent into exile, and furthermore has tried to subdue himself by massacre and conflagration cities belonging to our empire. 
his wicked attempts have proved unsuccessful, and so he has sent you, the instigator and furtherer of this villainy, under pretense of peace, to act come un espion, that is, as a spy among us. To him I made this reply. My master did not invade the city of Rome by force, nor as a tyrant. He freed her from a tyrant's yoke, or rather, from the yoke of many tyrants. Was she not ruled by effeminate debauchers, and what is even worse and more shameful, by harlots? Your power, methinks, was fast asleep then, and the power of your predecessors, who, in name alone, are called emperors of the Romans, while the reality is far different. If they were powerful, if they were emperors of the Romans, why did they allow Rome to be in the hands of harlots? Were not some of the holy popes banished, others so distressed that they could not procure their daily supplies, nor money wherewith to give alms? Did not Adalbart send insulting letters to your predecessors, the emperors Romanus and Constantine? Did he not rob and plunder the churches of the holy apostles? Who of you, emperors, led by seal for God, troubled to punish so heinous a crime and bring back the holy church to its proper state? You neglected it. My master did not. From the ends of the world he rose, and came to Rome, and drove out the ungodly, and gave back to the vicars of the holy apostles all their power and honour. Those who afterwards rose against him and the Lord Pope as being violators of their oath, sacrilegious robbers and torturers of their lords, the popes, in accordance with the decrees of such Roman emperors as Justinian, Valentinian, Theodosius, etc., he slew, beheaded, hanged, or exiled. If he had not done so, he himself would be an impious, unjust, cruel tyrant. It is a known fact that Berengar and Adalbart became his vassals and received the kingdom of Italy with a golden scepter from his hand, and that they promised fealty under oath in the presence of your servants, men still alive and now dwelling in this city. At the devil's prompting, they perfidiously broke their word, and therefore he justly took their kingdom from them as being deserters and rebels. You yourself would have done the same to men who had sworn fealty and then revolted against you. But, he said, there is one of Adelbart's vassals here, and he does not acknowledge the truth of this. If he denies it, I replied, one of my men at your command will prove to him tomorrow in single combat that it is so. Well, said he, he may, as you declare, have acted justly in this. Explain now why he attacked the borders of our empire with war and conflagration. We were friends and were thinking by marriage to enter into a partnership that would never be broken. This land, I answered, which you say belongs to your empire, is proved by race and language to be part of the kingdom of Italy. The Lombards held it in their power, and Louis, emperor of the Lombards, or Franks, freed it from the grip of the Saracens with great slaughter. For seven years also, Landulf, prince of Benevento and Capua, held it under his control. Nor would it even now have passed from the yoke of slavery to him and his descendants, had not your Emperor Romanos brought at a great price the friendship of our King Hugh. It was for this reason also that he made a match between King Hugh's bastard daughter and his own nephew and namesake. I see now that you think it shows weakness in my master, not generosity, when after winning Italy and Rome, he, for so many years, left them to you. The friendly partnership which you say you wished to form by a marriage we hold to be a fraud and a snare. You ask for a truce, but you have no real reason to want it nor we to grant it. Come, let us clear away all trickeries and speak the plain truth. My master has sent me to you to see if you will give the daughter of the Emperor Romanos and the Empress Theophano to his son, my master, the August Emperor Otto. If you give me your oath 
that the marriage shall take place, I am to affirm to you under oath that my master in grateful return will observe to do this and this for you. Moreover, he has already given you, his brother ruler, the best pledge of friendship by handing over Apulia, which was subject to his rule. I, to whose suggestion you declare this mischief was due, intervened in this matter, and there are as many witnesses to this as there are people in Apulia. Hmm. It is past seven o'clock, said Nicephorus, and there is a church procession which I must attend. Let us keep the business between us. We will give you a reply at some convenient season. <laughs>